Chaos EP2 Rebuilt. Now, hold on. Put down your torches and pitchforks. Please, hold on. Let me, let me clarify what I'm talking about specifically before anybody gets mad. Because this seems like a really weird choice to even put on the list. But there is a reason for it, and let me explain. Now, the EP2s, also known as the Bipolars, were built by General Electric in 1919 for the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad, also known as just the Milwaukee Road. And they were exceptional for their time. By utilizing their bipolar electric motors, they were able to outpull most steam engines of their era and served faithfully for a long time. Efficient, reliable, they were great locomotives. So that probably raises the issue, um, why in the blue heck are these even on the list? They aren't bad at all. And yes, that's true until they were rebuilt. Because this is a really odd case, because usually when I talk about poor locomotive design, oftentimes I'll mention that even if a locomotive does get good, sometimes when they first start out, they were really bad. In fact, some of the British Rail things I've discussed before have done that exact thing, where they were awful when they were introduced, but occasionally British Rail will have gone in and fixed the problems, and they've become better as a result. But the EP2s are the opposite of that. They started out great, and then towards the end of their life, well, here's what happened. In 1953, they were starting to suffer degrade from just being worn out in general. They'd been used extensively for 35 years, and during World War II, they were pushed even harder. So they had to be rebuilt and be given some improvements. Now, the first five, E1 through E5, were all rebuilt at the Tacoma shops and performed as they were supposed to do. They, they were rebuilt very well. And even though they went over budget, still, the results were good, so they were fine with that. However, because of the budget issue, the other four bipolars were sent to the Milwaukee shops. This is relevant because the workers in the Milwaukee shops were not accustomed to working on electric locomotives, like, at all. And according to the electrification department head, Lawrence Wiley, they did a poor job. Wiley's successor, T.B. Kirk, got a little more specific in this regard and said that he himself witnessed a group of disconnected wires on a newly rebuilt EP2 that were just bundled together and tagged with a note that said, we don't know where these go. After they were rebuilt, they were prone to electrical fires and constant failures, and apparently the Milwaukee shop crews had messed them up so bad that even the Tacoma shops could not correct them. As a result, they saw decreased use over time. And by 1962, all were scrapped, with the exception of Locomotive E2, which is still on display at the Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. Looking really good. It's been on static display for a long time, and it's a good bit of history to go see if you're ever in that area. And for me, this is just kind of a sad story, because, real talk, these were great locomotives that were ruined. They were turned into bad locomotives through budget cuts and ineptitude. So it's just kind of a shame overall. But hey, we know they were good once, and I'm sure plenty of us will still appreciate them for that. The EMD VL2. I get this one requested a lot, and for a long time I was pushing against the idea of putting it on the list, because technically speaking, from a mechanics perspective, this is a totally fine diesel electric locomotive. In terms of reliability or fuel consumption or speed or anything like that, it's totally fine. There's no issues there. The problem is that it was built to occupy a very strange niche that really just doesn't exist. It's, it's a space that didn't need to be occupied. You may look at this locomotive and think it looks a little weird, and don't worry, it does. And that's because it was designed specifically to occupy the space between a car body diesel and a hood unit. Now, the idea was that this would give the locomotive the strengths of both types, being a superior design overall. Problem is that no, no, what actually happened is that you got all the drawbacks of both designs with none of the benefits. It doesn't look as nice as a car body. It's not as easy to repair as a hood unit. The railings do not go all the way around, only on the front and the back, making it very difficult to work with for switch crews. And since it was really only powerful enough to be a switcher, you couldn't utilize it for passenger service either. 
and plus, again, it doesn't look as nice as some of the other car bodies. Some rail fans even call this locomotive ugly, and I try to avoid that word when it comes to locomotives because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I admit, they're definitely funny looking engines. It was also considered to be mechanically unreliable, however, this is disputed on the basis that it was less that it was mechanically unreliable, and more that the crews couldn't be bothered to fix it because they didn't like it and it was a pain in the butt to get into. So, you know, take from that what you will. Only 59 were ever made, and very few railways even gave them a shot. Although by some weird twist, multiple individuals of this locomotive have been preserved. Number 32, number 81, 82, 52, 54, 56, and 557 are all still around in various locations around America. So I guess you might be able to see one someday. I don't know why, but I mean, I guess that's nice. The New Zealand Railways Department WJ Class. This locomotive was a 284T, a tank engine, a big tank engine, and it was nicknamed Jumbo. Only one was ever created, and she was specifically designed for banking, helping other trains get over long hills. In the Wellington area where she worked, there were long grades around there, and she was quite useful in terms of helping other locomotives, and for literally nothing else. And in fact, according to sources, drivers and firemen actually despised the locomotive because while they admitted that, yeah, she was very, very powerful, that's all she was. She was so powerful that she had a really, really bad habit of breaking herself. She had cast frames of the bar type, and she had a rather consistent knack for breaking them repeatedly every time she went to do anything. I mean, she would be successful at what she did, but then she would need repair it immediately after. And it was a nightmare. No locomotive should break every time they went to do something, and Jumbo seemed to really like doing that. It didn't help that the spot that the frames kept breaking in was behind the smoke box saddle, so getting to it to make the repair was a nightmare as well. Over time, Jumbo fell out of favor, and she was withdrawn in 1927, and written off in 1928. Most of her was scrapped, but her boiler wound up being used as a washout boiler. The Great Western Railway 2602 class, also known as Krugers. Well, that's a funny looking engine. Huh. Why is the boiler up like it just... Why? Why is... Okay, whatever. These were experimental locomotives that were designed by William Dean. However, it is believed that his subordinate, George Jackson Churchward, was actually mostly responsible for the experimentation that was going on here. What was weird about this one? Well, the boiler operated at a higher pressure than normal. Not high pressure like the Fury, but still higher than normal. As a result, its combustion chamber and the long 28-inch stroke of the inside of the cylinders caused fractures of the solid crank axles. This problem persisted and could not be resolved. And though they were withdrawn, their boilers actually survived for a little longer and converted for stationary use in Swindon Works at reduced pressure. And they remained in service there to the 50s. So, you know, I guess that's a win, sort of. No, not really. That's that's not really a way to go for any steam locomotive, I think. The British Rail Class 800. You know, I'm not even going to bother yelling at you, because I'm starting to think you might enjoy it. But to be honest, I can't even yell at British Rail because they're not directly responsible for this one. This is an entirely different issue, because British Rail went defunct in 1997. The actual utilizers of this locomotive are the Great Western Railway and the London North Eastern Railway. Now, I would blame them, but I'm not going to, because they did not actually manufacture these things. Even though they're called British Rail Classes, these locomotives aren't British in any way. They were made by Hitachi, the Japanese corporation. And Hitachi has made good high-speed locomotives before. This ain't one of them. At least, not so far. And merely this is another very recent locomotive to put on this list, and to be fair, the verdict's still out as to how bad the 800s really are. But lately, it hasn't been looking good. And to their credit, when they're operating accordingly, when they're working fine, they're actually very good train sets overall. They're quick, they're efficient, they're comfortable, there's no issues there. But that's like with anything, when it's working. And after a few years of service, they started noticing issues. The first major problem was an issue with overheating, particularly in the summer. With the way the generators are designed, it meant that ventilation wasn't consistent. In the limited space they occupied, they became very prone to overheating. In fact, in Modern Railways magazine, there was the claim that in the summer of 2018, 
half of the units were taken out of action as the engines shut down because they were overheating. Now that's dubious at best, that seems like a bit of an exaggeration, I hope it is, but maybe it's not, maybe they're really that bad. But the real issues didn't start until a bit later, actually quite recently, just last year. It was discovered in the spring of 2021 that the Class 800 were suffering stress cracks on various components, whether it be the yaw damper brackets or whether it be the lifting pads. By the way, stress cracks at the speeds these locomotives operate are nothing to mess around with, so the railways had to suspend most of the trains. This caused a significant confusion and delay on trains between London to Scotland and to the west of the UK. It was a mess. Some of the locomotives did return to service on the 13th of May, but the verdict's still out on a few of them as they require more serious repairs and a long-term fix for the problem. Because of all this, the 800 is currently seen by many rail fans over in the UK as being awful. Terrible, yes, just appropriate for this list. But I do want to come to its defense a little bit on the basis that it's still pretty early in this locomotive's life cycle. And we have seen other locomotives become better even though they started out very poorly. So it's possible they may be able to figure out a way to utilize these locomotives effectively and the Class 800s may serve for years to come. That or they'll cut their losses and replace them with something else. Like, maybe they'll keep using the Class 43s. Because they still are. Because the 800s are supposed to replace the 43s and they can't take the 43s out of service because the 800s are so bad. Fun time. The West Australian Government Railways X-Class. I received a handful of requests from Australians wanting me to talk more about their country. And, okay, I'll pick some more bad locomotives from you guys. And you're welcome, by the way. I'm sure this is exactly what you meant. Anyway, the Class X, which is a name that I actually adore, was a diesel-electric built between 1954 and 1956 by Bayer Peacock and Company as well as Metropolitan Vickers. In that era, like a lot of places, diesels were fairly new to the rail line, so this was kind of an experiment to see how well they would go. And in Class X's defense, it did serve for quite a long time and is considered really successful, but not because it was any good. Because... Failures on it commenced within weeks of the locomotives first being released. In the early years of their use, the steam locomotives that were still on the rails had much higher availability when compared to the Class X. The engines had a habit of burning and leaking oil, their bearings were underfed, their heads and pistons popped and vibrated all over the place, and they suffered from ring scuffling for most of their lives. The only reason why the Class X lasted as long as they did was that the Midland Railway Workshop staff worked their butts off keeping them in line, trying to work out the kinks and make them function. And when all was said and done, over 600 design faults, mainly with the Crosley engines they were using, had to be overcome. Honestly, had these diesels been in place at any other location on the planet, they probably would have been scrapped well before any kind of fixes were put into place. Because, let's be fair, over 600 design faults, that's a lot of problems. Like, a lot of problems. I don't know how you mess this thing up that bad. But to its credit, the last one was withdrawn in 1988, so they served for over 30 years. So that's not bad, all things considered. And six of them are still in preservation. They're often referred to as submarines by rail fans, but apparently the WAGR always called them hummingbirds, probably because of the noise they made. The Australian Standard Garrett, or ASG. Yep, stick it with Australia. You asked for it. You asked me. You asked me to talk about you, okay? Don't yell at me. You wanted some representation, I'm giving you some representation. It just happens that the first time I'm doing it is on a list of really terrible locomotives, but don't worry, you can't outdo British Rail. It's not possible. In 1939, the Australian government formed the Commonwealth Land and Transport Board to take responsibility for the country's land transport networks, and that included the railways. The thing about the board is that they had the power to override decisions of the state railways. It sounds like a bit of government overreach, but the idea was to keep things more consistent. The CLTB appointed a new commissioner of railways in Western Australia, whose name was Joseph Ellis. Ellis recommended that Garrett locomotives be purchased for the railways. However, the CLTB didn't want a medium or heavy version of a Garrett, they just wanted the light so it could operate on any narrow gauge line in Australia. Not every railway was happy about this arrangement. The Queensland Railways, for example, were vocal opponents, preferring a more traditional style steam locomotive. But in the end, they were overruled, and the Australian Standard Garrett was put into production. It was built in a record-breaking four months, entering service in 1943. Only 57 were ever built, 
And that was because the CLTV was partially put into place because of World War II. When the war ended, the need for extra locomotives was minimized, so they didn't have a reason to make any more, at least at that point. But a major issue with the ASG is that, as the name might imply, Australian Standard Garrett, this was meant to be a standardized design that could help standardize all the railways all across Australia. But the problem was, there were many differences between the various states and railway networks, including loading gauges, sharpness of curves, axle load, and especially in Queensland. So the design wound up being very compromising, not necessarily standard. For example, their solution to make sure the long wheelbase could negotiate sharp curves, the leading driving wheels were designed to be flangeless. A flange is a lit. Those little divots you see on most train wheels, those things. Now why would this help it negotiate tighter curves? Well, since there were no flanges, it meant that the wheel was able to teeter off the rail a little bit with much greater flexibility on tighter curves. And it has been utilized in locomotives, but in this case it proved to be a major flaw because the locomotives had a rather constant habit of derailing every time they went to turn or go over a point, or really any time they just felt like it. The crews also hated them because the firebox door opened flat on the floor of the driving cab. Not only is that just really inconvenient, but it also maximized heat radiation into the crew compartment. This meant that they were super uncomfortable to work on. Most of them didn't last past the mid-1950s, however, a few were resold to Emu Bay and Finesford Cement Works Railways. They were actually a bit more successful for them, probably because they're shorter lines with less tight curves. The only complete ASG that's still around is G33, which worked for Fines Ford Cement Works Railway until 1957. It was on Saturday display until May 2013 when it was moved to Bellarine Railway in Queenscliff, who wanted to fully restore it to operation. As far as we will tell, it hasn't happened quite yet, but they are still working on it, so you might be able to see one of these run again. The Baldwin DR-12-8-1500-2 which is also known as the Centipede, which is what I'm going to be calling it because I'm not saying that long number code more than I have to. The Centipede was Baldwin's first serious attempt at a road diesel locomotive, and it was a bold one, attempting to be cutting edge and distinctive when compared to other diesels that were being made available in the late 1940s when they were built. The prototype set did a tour run on some American railroads, and they did see a few orders from Pennsylvania Railroad, Seaboard Airline Railroad, as well as National Railways of Mexico. But the problem was that the centipedes were obsolete by the time they were even being produced. They were behind the times. The other problem is that Baldwin kind of missed the mark when it came to designing a diesel because I'm sure you've probably already noticed why people call it a centipede. And that's, um, why in the blue heck do they have so many friggin' wheels? And I can happily explain this, Baldwin essentially, quite literally, designed the wheel layout like a large steam locomotive. Under the AAR, they'd be 2-D plus D-2. But under the white notation, which usually isn't used for diesels, but I'm going to use it for this one because it's actually way more appropriate, these are 4884s, giving them the same wheel layout as big boys, with four leading wheels, eight driving wheels, followed by eight driving wheels, followed by four trailing wheels. The problem is diesels just aren't done in this manner. That's a steam locomotive layout. There was no reason to have this many wheels on it or, in fact, unpowered wheels at all on a diesel locomotive. It served no purpose, and it made maintenance an absolute nightmare. Maintenance is already hard enough on car body style diesels, but with this many extra axles, it made working on them and fixing any problems they had quite a pain in the butt. Baldwin also manufactured them like steam locomotives, and by that I mean they did not use common assembly lines with standardized procedures like with modern diesel manufacturers. No, they built them one at a time, like steam locomotives, the result of which was that each centipede was actually slightly different from the next centipede that was made, meaning that the wiring and equipment was often in slightly different spots between units, making even routine maintenance that much worse. They were not considered very successful, and although Pennsylvania Railroad gave them an honest try, eventually they were only relegated to helper service, and all of them were scrapped by the late 60s. It's kind of sad, to be honest, because I do like that they're distinctive. They get your attention, and they look neat. But looking interesting doesn't necessarily mean they are interesting. And the fact was that Baldwin's design ethos when it came to these things was completely outdated, and they were never going to work. The British Rail Class 84 I'm not speaking to you. That's how I feel about the situation now. You want attention. I'm not giving it to you. 
You're like a spoiled child. You sit in the corner. Think about what you've done to deserve this. While I think about what I've done to deserve this. Ugh. The Class 84 was manufactured between 1960 and 1961. Only 10 were made, and these are not actually diesels. Which is a bit of a shift, I know. But it's still 60s, and it's still British Rail. So you probably know what's about to happen. These were electric locomotives. Built for the electrified lines on the British Rail network. And let me tell you, the Class 84s are probably one of the worst examples of an electric locomotive the British Rail ever delivered. Because... They had a problem, and to be fair, a lot of them built at this time had the same problem, because they used mercury arc rectifiers, which were used for converting high voltage AC into direct current, or DC. The problem was that the mercury arc rectifiers were repeatedly prone to malfunction and complete failure. And in 1962, the first one, E3036, was returned to GEC, who made the electrical equipment used in the things, so they could try to find a solution. By 1963, the rest were all out of service for the same problem, and the problems persisted until 67, where they were just kind of placed into storage. The 84s probably would have been scrapped at that point, but British Rail did an extension of the West Coast Main Line's electrification to Glasgow, and that meant they needed more electric locomotives. There weren't enough Class 87s, which were actually pretty good, in order to do the job, so the 84s wound up being one of a handful of electric locomotives that British Rail opted to rebuild in the early 70s in order to replace their mercury arc rectifiers with silicone rectifiers. Silicone rectifiers were much more reliable, and in fact, every other class that had this overhaul done wound up being pretty successful once the rectifiers were changed out. Except the 84. For whatever reason, the 84 still had persistent problems, even after being given the new silicone rectifiers, and by 1980 they were all withdrawn from service. A few were used as bank testers, or some experimentation with the electric systems, but in the end they would all be scrapped with the sole exception of 84001. It was preserved by the UK's National Railway Museum, and is actually currently on loan to the Scottish Railway Museum. 84001 is actually very special as a preserved piece of rolling stock, because it is the only surviving example of a mainline post-steam locomotive that was created by North British Locomotive Company. There are a few small shunting locomotives from them still around, but this is the only big mainline one. So even though they were a complete pain in service, you have to give 84001 this. It's now a solid piece of railway history, and that's something to be proud of at least. The Bud SPV-2000. Ugh. These are diesel multiple unit rail cars built by the Bud Company. No, not the beer, this Bud Company. And this was not the first time they had built a diesel multiple unit rail car. Their popular rail diesel car, or RDC as they called it, was actually quite successful. And SPV 2000 was supposed to be the successor to that, and it was not. It was horrible. It was a disaster. It, they were just unspeakable garbage. And I usually don't say that, even about bad locomotives, but really, really? The 2000s are just so bad. I say that as an American, mind you, the Bud Company is from Philadelphia, so I'm allowed. They were built between 1978 and 1981, though only 31 were actually produced, plus 14 unassembled shells. Why was that? Well, from the get-go, these cars may look a little familiar to you, and that is because Bud straight up used the Amfleet passenger cars from Amtrak as the shells for their rail cars. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that decision. I mean, those are nice passenger cars, don't get me wrong, but they weren't designed to be power units. And apparently Bud completely threw any kind of quality control out the window because these are some of the worst rail cars ever produced. They failed at every single possible chance they got. They were so bad that a 1982 New York Magazine even called them defective. Their power units just never worked, ever. People called them seldom powered vehicles, and often when they were used, they were just being pulled by a traditional diesel locomotive. And to be honest, that's how most of these things wound up. Eventually, they were just converted straight back into Amfleet passenger cars, and some of them are still being used like that today. Although two of them did wind up somewhat in preservation. Number 293, formerly Metro North Railroad, is currently at the Connecticut Eastern Railroad Museum, and apparently Condot 1001 is being restored by the Danbury Railway Museum, 
which is also in Connecticut. Don't know why Connecticut likes these rail cars, because they were awful, but hey, you know, preservation history, I'm fine with that. It's just something I find weird, because I hate these things. They are so terrible. They're just gone. Ah! The NS Class 1100. This one excites me, because this is the first time we've been able to talk about a locomotive from the Netherlands. Although they were actually constructed by Alstom, which is a French company, they were built for the... Oh boy. Niederlandse Spoorwagen? Yes? No, I butchered that horribly. I'm sorry, I gave it a shot. Listen, they're electric locomotives operating off of pantograph lines, and technically speaking, they ran. I mean, on the technical level, they were fine in terms of their pulling abilities, maintenance levels, and their reliability. No, 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 no. That wasn't really the problem with these. The real problem was that the drivers that worked for Niederlandse Spoorwagen just hated these locomotives. So so much. And that's because of a few unusual traits these locomotives had. The main one being that their buffers were actually attached to the bogies, not the main body. Normally buffers are used as a stopgap between cars or locomotives, and they're designed to absorb some level of impact and to stabilize things in between the rolling stock. But because the 1100's buffers were attached to the bogies, it meant they never really could be stable at all. As a result, the riding quality on the 1100s was just atrocious. They shook horribly, basically non-stop. Additionally, the cabs were actually designed for the comfort of French drivers in 1950, which is when these locomotives were introduced. Now, the issue is that the average height of the Netherlands at the time was taller than the average height of French drivers, apparently because anyone taller than about 5 foot 7, or 1.7 meters, had a really hard time in the non-adjustable driver's seat. Also, the air drafted around the driver's lower legs, making an already uncomfortable ride that much worse. And if that all wasn't bad enough, the cooling fans for the engine compartment were actually incredibly loud, so they were uncomfortable and noisy. They lasted a remarkably long time despite that, because, like I said, technically speaking, in terms of moving, they were fine, but they were so bad that until 1980, their drivers were actually paid a special bonus that's usually designated for dirty or unpleasant work. Yes, really. The Netherlands' sport wagon literally paid their train drivers more just to work on this specific class of locomotives, because apparently they were that bad. Currently, there are five of these locomotives still in preservation. And I do put them low on the list because, like I said, technically they ran well. They just made their driver's jobs a living nightmare. That kind of puts them on the list just because of that. I've never heard of another locomotive needing a financial incentive in order to get people to actually use it, you know? The Chorus Oimper Oh, God. <clears throat> the, the CC1. We're going to go with that. The CC1, which was designed for the CI... E? It's got a little thing over it normally. I do not know how to say that. They're responsible for the trains in Ireland. They're Ireland's British Rail. We'll go with that. But the CC1 was actually developed by Oliver Bully, who's come up before on these lists. He was a bit of an eccentric person when it came to locomotive design, and he made some of the best locomotives, and he also made some of the worst, because he could never be average. It was just kind of a thing that happened. And the CC1 may look a little familiar to you, and that is because it was developed right after his ill-fated leader class, which, as you recall, appeared on my very first list of worst trains ever. And the CC1 is sometimes considered worse, but actually looking at it, it's honestly not as bad, as the CC1 had many improvements put into it that the leader never got a chance to have. As a result, it tended to have less problems overall, but it still wasn't very good. And that's because the CC1 was also known as the Turf Burner, because it was designed to not use coal as fuel, but turf, which is an Irish term for peat. Peat is an accumulation of partially decayed vegetation or organic matter, and it's basically coal before it's actually coal, or other fossil fuels for that matter. It takes a long time for fossil fuels to form, but peat is a very early step in that process, and it can be used as fuel like coal is, but it's not quite as efficient. There were many experiments before this one to make peat burning locomotives, because peat is readily available in Ireland. They actually have the biggest concentration of it over there. But none of these designs really ever worked very well or for that long, just because of the nature of the fuel itself. The CC1 was meant to be the perfected version of a turf burner, 
but ultimately it had too many problems to be worth it. Its water consumption was very high, and its boiler's double-ended nature and sectional construction gave rise to just a lot of operational difficulties. Its reversing gear was also a pain in the butt, never operating correctly at any point during its development. Additionally, at its number two end, the driver and fireman were actually on the same side of the locomotive. This is weird, because on a traditional steam locomotive, they would be on two different sides of the cab and therefore able to spot signals more easily. But this way it raised concerns that a signal could possibly be missed, and that's always dangerous. The CC-1 did make a few trips hauling transfer freight trains in the Dublin area, but Boyd himself would retire in May of 1958. As soon as he was gone, the railway board abandoned the CC-1 project, finally withdrawing it in 1963, and it was scrapped in 1965. The EMD SD-50. This is an odd one for me because this is a hood unit, and generally speaking, hood units are usually pretty good. And to be honest, looking at hood units, it's actually really hard to tell them apart sometimes. Looking at the SD-50, you might mistake these for SD-40s or 40-2s, and 40-2s are great, phenomenal, actually appearing on my top 5 best locomotives. So what's wrong with the SD-50? Well, they were meant to be an evolution of the SD-40s, as the name might imply, except that they weren't at all. They were supposed to compete with General Electric's Dash 7 line, because the Dash 7s are great and we're starting to take some of the EMD's business. But the SD-50 was just not the way to go. They weren't the first successors of the SD-40s. The SD-45 and 45-2s actually came before, but they didn't sell well, not because there was any real fault with them, but because they used enormous 20-cylinder engines with high fuel consumption, and they came into being during the 1970s fuel crisis. So it was really bad timing for them. The SD-50 shrunk down the horsepower a little bit, and I actually just used an updated of the V16-645 diesel engine using the SD-40-2s, but they uprated it to 3,500 horsepower and later to 3,600 horsepower. The problem was that those engines were not actually designed to do that, and whatever modifications they gave it weren't enough. The 50s were plagued with constant engine and electrical failures. As a result, they were incredibly unpopular, and really tarnished EMD's reputation at the time. Only 431 were produced for sale, which is a pittance compared to the over 4,000 SD40-2s they created. The SD50s were not long for the world, and eventually the SD60s were released, and they were much more successful. Though it is worth noting that many of the SD50s that were built are still in service, as their technical problems could be fixed, and drivers knew not to overstress the engines. British Rail Class 48. One day, I'm gonna make one of these lists and not have to stare at your stupid logo. One day. Today is not that day. Today you have made sure to make me miserable once again. Thirteen times. Thirteen lists. And here you are. Here you stand. Unashamed. And you know what you should be. This is embarrassing. Not for me. But for you. The Class 48 was a diesel locomotive class that only consisted of five examples and it was built and delivered between 1965 and 1966. Now the 48s may look a little familiar to some people because I'm sure some of you are going to get them mixed up with the Class 47s. However, understand that while they look very, very, very similar, the 48s were an experiment. And they differed from the 47s because they were fitted with Sulzer V12 12 LVA24 power units, which produced 2,650 VHP, or about 1,976 kilowatts. The Class 47s had a standard 12 LDA28C twin bank 12-cylinder unit. They were testing efficiency and power output here, just to see how the different engines might work out. And the answer is, well, they didn't. They were terrible. The 12 LVA24 engines just didn't work. They were unreliable, and the locomotives spent more time out of service than their standard Class 47 counterparts. Engine failures happened all the time, and the repairs for such engines were actually incredibly expensive. All this sounds very familiar, because it's something we've talked about with pretty much every single diesel class produced during the 1960s for British Rail. This keeps happening, and just for reference, these ones were made by Brush Traction as well as Falcon Works. But to be fair, this was an experiment, so I get that. And the locomotives stayed in service for quite a long time, the last one not being withdrawn until 2002. 
and one of them is even in preservation. However, none of this is relevant to the Class 48, because by the time all of that occurred, oh, they were Class 47s. Yeah. See, because the initial engines of the Class 48 were so awful, they had actually been converted into Class 47s in 1971. So, their longevity and preservation has nothing to do with them being Class 48s. As Class 48s, they were awful. It's just that they were converted into a different class entirely, and that's the reason why they survived, and why one of them, D-1705, is still in preservation. And, you know, okay, I'll take it. That's fine. At least they found a new lease on life and got new engines. It's kind of like when Henry got rebuilt into a Black 5. Le Eagle, or The Eagle, is... <laughs> it's, um... It's a locomotive! Uh, wow, where do I even begin? Uh, it was number 261, and it was designed for the Lowest Railway in France. In 1855, it appeared at the International Exhibition in Paris. And as you may have noticed by now, it had the largest wheels ever fitted to a French locomotive at 9 feet four inches. That's actually just short of the world record for wheels on a locomotive, and that's allegedly held by the Hurricane, which was built for the Great Western Railroad in 1838. Maybe I'll talk about that some other time. Now, the thing about the Eagle over here is that it's, um, well, this is not a good design at all, for just many, many reasons. The big wheels don't actually add anything to the overall tractive effort, generally. I mean, sometimes they can, but the wheels have to be upsized, within the same ratio as the rest of the locomotive, and quite obviously, they were not. Because the wheels were so big, the axles were too high for a normal boiler to be placed between the frame members. So they used a boiler that was kind of divided in two, and the driving axles passed between them. That sounds really weird, because it was, and no, it was not very efficient at all. Maintenance was a nightmare on these things, and there's no record of it actually being used in revenue service because of its bizarre design. I mean, yeah, it gets your attention because of those ginormous wheels, but it didn't actually add anything. There were some dubious claims that this locomotive was incredibly fast, or apparently having pulled a 100-ton load of a 1-100th incline. Apparently designers back then even claimed it can go 100 miles an hour, which would have been insane in 1855. But there's no evidence of this being factual at all. It was probably just propaganda to make people more interested in the bizarre take on locomotive technology we had going on here. Like I said, it was basically never used. It's unknown what happened to it. Given it's not really around anymore and information's hard to come by, it was likely scrapped not long after the exhibition in Paris where it was shown off. What a way to go. The Bud Metroliner. Oh, the Bud Company again. You know, admittedly, they used to be pretty good. In the 60s and 70s, they just imploded. When it came to rolling stock manufacturing, I have no idea what happened. Now, the Metro Liners were electric multiple unit EMU rail cars, and they were designed for high speed service between New York City and Washington, D.C. on the Northeast Corridor. Aesthetically, they looked perfectly fine, and they were known to be mechanically sound. But electrically? Not so much. They were plagued with reliability problems in their electronic systems, and to make matters worse, they were supposed to be high speed. They weren't. They were meant to travel upwards of 150 miles per hour, exceeding the Japanese Shinkansen in that category, and yet when put into service they could only ever reach a maximum of 120 miles per hour, and that was on a good day. Plus, because of their reliability issues, it meant they often just weren't working at all. They would have been ultimately completely worthless, but Metroliner actually found some use for them because, at the end of the day, they were just cars. Many of them wound up being converted into just regular old passenger cars designed to be pulled by a traditional locomotive. And in that regard, they were totally fine. They were only bad when they tried to power themselves. The British Rail Class 60. I just wanted to stop. I don't know what past life I had where I was so horrid in my existence where I must now experience an eternity of this, but I, I just wanted to stop. The British Rail Class 60 was built between 1989 and 1993, so they arrived pretty late in terms of British Rail's existence as an entity. Diesel electrics that were designed to haul freight and built by brush traction, when it was first introduced, it was found to possess a number of what are loosely referred to as teething problems. 
Now, understand that whenever I say teething problems, in my head, I'm thinking one or two issues, you know, and that's normal for any locomotive class introduced. No. The <clears throat> teething problems of the class 60 included the control software, the suspension system, the structural elements, and reportedly, there were in excess of 100 individual faults identified with them. And I think once you get past the 10, maybe 20 mark in terms of problems, you're no longer teething. You're just not great. To British Rail's credit though, they grew a spine when it came to handling the Class 60s, as they told Brush that if they couldn't fix the outstanding problems, they would cancel the entire contract. It would take another two years before the first member of the class was available for traffic. And after fixing, they were all right, but they were never as powerful as they hoped they would be. And it only got worse when British Rail was privatized. 100 of the units came out of the management of the English, Welsh, and Scottish Railway, now known as DB Cargo UK. The company already was known to have a generally disfavor attitude towards all of British Rail's locomotives, but they were really not impressed with the Class 60s in particular. Between 2004 and 2007, apparently between 50% and 75% of the total fleet was out of action at any given time. But in the Class 60s defense, this may not have been due to any direct faults with them at this point, but more likely EWS's just general dislike of them, and therefore not allocating any time or effort to actually fix them at all. They remain in service still, even to this day, but as of the 20th of January 2020, 60006 was scrapped, the first of the class to actually receive that fate. Fortunately, just the next month, 60086 was transferred to the Wensleydale Railway and into preservation. So as bad as the Class 60s started out and wound up being due to mismanagement, it seems like they might wind up having a new life where they can be admired on the UK's heritage railways. And you know, I can't complain about that. They're not the worst things I've ever seen. Not even close. The Bombardier LRC. Oh dear. The LRC. I've gotten a ton of requests for this one, and believe me, I get it. In terms of tilt train technology, the LRC is probably one of the worst example of it. Yeah, I know the APT had its issues, but you know what? The APT wound up working. The LRC, well, okay, it had some good points. Manufactured between 1980 and 1984, they were pretty fast. And more in particular, they were actually highly fuel efficient. It was estimated that in terms of fuel cost per passenger, they were not only cheaper than every other locomotive in their class, but they were also cheaper than regular buses. They were originally meant to be used by Amtrak as well as Via Rail, but ultimately Via was the only one to give the locomotives a shot because, well, they were just so bad. They had, again, <clears throat> teething troubles, but their teething troubles were not only consistent and repeated mechanical issues, but hilariously, well, like I said, these are tilt trains. They're meant to tilt into curves in order to maintain higher speeds on lines that wouldn't normally tolerate that. Okay, fine. Problem. The tilt mechanisms tended to get stuck in the tilt. So when the train was supposed to level off, it wouldn't and would simply keep going down the rails, constantly tilting to one side or the other, which is funny, but also awful. The LRC has never received much love from anybody, and in the end, the best thing to come out of them were the cars themselves. VRL kept using the cars that were meant to go with the LRC set because they could disable the tilts and they were perfectly serviceable passenger cars. So in that regard, they were fine. But that tilt mechanic really sealed the deal. They just didn't do what they were supposed to do. However, at least two have actually entered preservation. So I guess that's a win. Maybe? No, no, nobody, nobody, nobody likes that. Okay, I, I don't know, man. There was a whole Save the LRC campaign to do this, so I guess some people do appreciate them. I guess they look kind of cool. I'll give them that. The British Rail Class 180. Hey, 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 you can't be here twice! We stopped doing that a long time ago! How dare you! How dare you show your face here again! Get out! Get out of my sight! But to be fair, this isn't the traditional government entity British Rail as these were only introduced after privatization. These train sets were built by Alstrom, initially for the first Great Western Railway for the UK, though they had a few other operators as well. 
Additionally, they were known to be just the worst. They had frequent mechanical failures, and even though they were meant to replace things like the Inner City 125, and did initially, they wound up actually being replaced themselves with the thing they were supposed to replace, the 125, the HSTs. They put them back into service because the 180s were so god-awful. They were so bad that First Great Western, the ones who initially wanted them, actually sent them back to the leasing company Angel Trains between 2007 and 2009 because they just couldn't deal with them anymore. Most of the railways wound up replacing the 180 with the 800, which also appeared to be terrible. You know, I just don't know what's going on with the high-speed trains in the UK right now. Can one of my subscribers over in the UK, I know there's plenty of you, please tell me what is happening? Because it feels like every time I talk about a modern high-speed train on your rail line, something is going wrong with it, and I just don't think y'all deserve the headache. I'm just concerned. That's all I'm trying to say. The North Pacific Coast number 21. This was a one-off locomotive, and it's technically a 440 American, but I'm sure you've already noticed it. <laughs> it's it's a <laughs> it's um well it was nicknamed the Freak, and and I get that because because wow that it looks like someone attempted to construct a cab forward locomotive in their garage like that's that's where we're at with this thing number 21 was the first cab forward steam locomotive a cab forward is a type of steam locomotive that does exactly what its name would imply the cab instead of being in the back is in the front the idea was to make it easier for drivers to see what's in front of the train. And some versions of this setup were pretty successful, but they never really took off because railways were always concerned about their crew's survivability in the event of a head-on collision. In a traditional steam locomotive, the boiler's in the way, so they felt that gave the crew added protection. But cab forwards could work, and did work on many railways, but the first doubting, the number 21, was not one of them. It had terrible adhesion weight, and it was an oil burner. And the burners were prone to damage because of how close they were to the water tubes. It's also technically a rebuild. It was constructed out of parts of NPCRR number 5, which had been dismantled in 1897. But number 21 didn't last long. It was built in 1901, and it was scrapped by 1905. It didn't destroy future attempts at cab forwards, but even for a first attempt, I feel like they didn't try hard enough. It's all I'm trying to say. The EA-202 series, also known as the KFW I-9000, which I'm not going to say, I'm just going to say EA-202 or just 202, is an electric multiple train unit, or EMU. It was reduced by Industry Kareda API, which I'm hopefully saying right. The acronym of that is INCA, and they operate across Greater Jakarta. And they actually collaborated with Bombardier Transportation to build the series, and it was completed in 2011. They created 40 units total, each one containing four cars. However, when they were finally introduced in 2013, it turned out that they had a number of, shall we say, flaws, in that they just broke down all the time. They just stopped working. They quit at any given moment. The issue seems to be down to their electrical system, but if that wasn't bad enough, even when they were working, they suffered an issue with their air conditioning units. I know it sounds minor, but these are passenger service, and Jakarta is in Indonesia. It's kind of hot there sometimes. Well, apparently the ACs had a habit of just, uh, blowing hot air, which you may recognize as unhelpful in a situation where it's 100 degrees out and you prefer not to die of heat stroke. The 202s were eventually recalled back to Inca, who did wind up refurbishing them between 2019 and 2020. They're still in service, and as far as I understand, the refurbishment seems to have been a success. Now that certain fixes have been put in place, they actually seem to be okay. So at least this is one case where one of these trains did turn out to be good after they were bad. The United Aircraft and Transport Corporation Turbo Train. Oh boy, that's a train. Got a funny nose. Look at that funny nose. That's what I think when I see the turbo train. But hey, it was meant to be aerodynamic and modern, and it was constructed in the 60s, so it kind of makes sense why it looks a little weird with our knowing how the future looks and they imagining how the future is going to look. Now, the history of the turbo train is actually a lot longer than you'd think. 
going all the way back to the 50s with the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. Some of the technology that went into the Turbotrain was based off of their research. Turbotrain wound up being a pretty interesting and unique take on railroad technology because not only were these a tilt train, but they were also one of the first gas turbine power trains to enter service. They were very ambitious, and you may be thinking that I'm about to say that the tilt function didn't work on these because that's what I've said about pretty much every tilt train we've talked about on these lists, but I'm gonna be real with you, that wasn't the issue at all. The turbo train's tilt actually worked quite well. Its problem was, well, pretty much everything else. They occupied a unique space in railroading history, and this was a big transitionary period between private ownership of the rail lines and government ownership of the rail lines. During its testing phase, it actually set a world record for gas turbine-powered rail vehicles, reaching 170.8 miles per hour. That's 274.9 kilometers per hour. When they were working, they were outrageously fast. And when they first entered service, they were actually based on a lease from the Department of Transportation to the New Haven Railroad. Thing was, New Haven had already been in bankruptcy since 1961. And in 1969, they were absorbed into the Penn Central Railroad, which inherited the contract. Then, Penn Central, unable to make a profit as well, also wound up falling under the ownership of what we know in America as Amtrak. The thing was, when Amtrak was formed, they inherited a lot of old stuff, new stuff, weird stuff, from all sorts of different railways doing all sorts of different things. The turbo trains were just too odd for them to deal with, because they were making an effort to standardize their lines. So service under Amtrak did not last long, and they were put out of revenue service in 1976. The Amtrak just never really cared about them, and before they were scrapped here in America, they were originally going to be sold to the Illinois Central. But the mechanical condition of the train sets was so bad that Illinois Central refused to take them, so they were sent for scrap instead. Canadian National Railways, on their own, ordered five of the turbo trains for their Montreal to Toronto service. They were originally supposed to enter service in 1967, but they were delayed, due to technical difficulties, until 1969, which really should have let them know that something bad was about to happen. Despite this, they were so gung-ho to get it into service that they rushed it through its trials, they only tested them for about a year. And most trains go through at least six to seven years of testing before entering service, especially strange experimental ones. Its first demonstration was in 1968, and apparently nothing could go right for the turbo train because it managed to run into a truck at a highway crossing near Kingston. To be fair, that was not the turbo train's fault, and this actually worked out better for the train in a weird way, because initially there were concerns that lightweight trains like the Turbo would be dangerous in that sort of collision. But the train remained upright and didn't take that much damage from the impact. However, as soon as they entered official service in December of 1969, there were already immediate issues with them. The brake systems actually froze in the winter. And this is Canada. Look. Look. It gets cold in Canada. That is a thing that tends to occur. And apparently the Turbo Train just couldn't tolerate that. And that was never their only issue. They suffered other mechanical issues all the time, and Canadian Nationals management publicly expressed their dissatisfaction with the performance of the train sets. UAC actually responded to this and said that Canadian National was exaggerating the issues and had pulled the turbo train out of service for fairly minor technical problems. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, minor, minor. Yeah, the brakes freezing and not working. On it's not a big deal. Like, what could possibly happen? I don't see how that could possibly turn out poorly for anybody involved. Are you kidding me? But to their credit, the turbo train did eventually get a little bit better after some modifications, and it's arguable that their issue may have been they were simply too far ahead of their time. They were ambitious, and when they were working, they were outstanding. Canadian National's passenger operations were taken over by Via Rail in 1978, and they inherited the turbo trains. But they only lasted until 1982, their final run and they were replaced by, go figure, the LRC, another tilt train that we talked about just on the last list. It also suffered mechanical trouble, and its tilt didn't even work most of the time. So in a way, they downgraded. Just for all the turbo train's problems, it did the tilt thing well. And good for it. The British Rail Class 17. Oh, for the love of all that is holy. You know, it's funny that I'm talking about the Class 17 too, because technically, I've already done this. Class 17 actually appeared on my second list of bad trains. Why am I talking about it again? That's because on that list, it shared the number four spot with both the Class 15s and the Class 16s, which were both pretty bad on their own. And I kind of put the Class 17s in there as a bit of a footnote, and my thought was at the time that if I put enough British Rail things in like one spot, 
you know, talking about three edges at once, I wouldn't have to talk about them for that much longer. We are now on part 15, and I'm still staring at this logo, and I just feel that perhaps the Class 17 deserves its own spot anyway, because obviously there's no escape for me, and I honestly missed the mark a little bit when I talked about the Class 17, as they were quite a bit different from the 15s and 16s, and in many ways, a lot worse. They were constructed by the Clayton Equipment Company, but they actually subcontracted it out to Bayer Peacock and Company. The 17s were meant to be a Type 1, which was the lowest British rail power classification for mainline diesels. In an ambitious double-engine design, they used a pair of Paxman 6Z HXL six-cylinder horizontal engines, one on each side of the cab. And the reason the cab was centered was because one of the design parameters was that the driver be able to see well in both directions. It's also relevant to mention that when British Rail asked a bunch of companies to submit design work for the specific criteria, they chose Clayton's design based off of a drawing board. They hadn't actually made a prototype of it yet, and not only did they choose it based off that, they put it in order for 117 of the things based off of a drawing! Like, what? How are you that inept? I understand maybe ordering one for testing based off of a drawing, but you don't even know if they work yet and you ordered over a hundred of them. Like, let's put it in a real life example. How would you feel about purchasing a car? Oh wait, I'm sorry. You have to order over a hundred cars. Also, you can't test drive it at all. And the thing hasn't even been manufactured yet. Does that sound like a good deal to you? Because apparently it sounded great to British Rail. But the Class 17s turned out, expectedly, awful. They are arguably one of the worst diesels in the history of British Rail. The Paxman engines they used were atrocious and suffered frequent failures, and they used an ambitious but admittedly unusual electronic transmission, not a hydraulic one like pretty much every other diesel did at the time, which also caused other problems. Oh, yeah, and the one design parameter that was given, the one where the driver has to see well in both directions, yeah, the noses on each side were too long, and it made it difficult for the drivers to actually see well in either direction. It literally wound up being worse than if they had just put the cab on one side, because at least there, they could see well in one direction. At one point during their use, availability was considered about 60%, even after extensive modifications. They were horrific, and they did not last long at all. They were introduced in the early 60s, and they were all withdrawn by 1971. Interestingly though, somehow, D8568 has survived into preservation because not all of them were immediately scrapped. Some were sold off for industrial use. When the company that bought her was done, she was secured for preservation and is usually based at the Chinar and Princess Risborough Railway. But according to my information, it's currently at the Severn Valley Railway following an extensive overhaul. So apparently you could still see one of the worst diesels ever produced by anyone ever. I don't know how to feel about that, but preservation is good, I guess. The New Zealand Government Railways RM Class 88-seater. These are another example of multiple unit rail cars, although these were diesels. They were actually the most numerous rail cars in the service to the NZR, and their introduction in 1955 finally saw the demise of steam-hauled provincial passenger trains, as well as mixed trains. 35 were built and introduced, and they were not good at all. They were supposed to be manufactured by the Drury Car Company in the UK, but they subcontracted the job out to the Birmingham Railway Carriage and Wagon Company, apparently they didn't do a great job overall, as there were significant delays immediately with delivering the rail cars, and one was even damaged in transit. But once they finally got them, people were enthusiastic. Newspapers heralded them as the new dawn for long-distance rail travel in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, so um, they immediately started overheating from ballast dust and engine failure. This led to the rail cars running 20 to 30 minutes late every two or three days. So, you know, at least the failures were regular. But that wasn't the worst thing about them. Oh no, they suffered frequent internal fires, which not only led to the cars themselves burning, but it also caused external fires in the farmland and foliage along the tracks. Fortunately, it looks like this issue never resulted in the deaths of anybody, but the fires were caused by excessive hot carbon particles in the exhaust emissions. Also, the crankcases were not actually strong enough to absorb the power of the diesel engines that drove the rail cars in the first place. Ten of the rail cars, when they were examined, found that they had wrecked crankcases and blown motors. 
Fiat had actually been the ones to manufacture the engines used in these rail cars. The staff and fitters from the company came from Italy to basically rebuild the entire engines and the power system of all the cars. Once this was done, they were a lot better, but a second batch that was supposed to be ordered wound up falling through as the NZR simply didn't trust them anymore. Once fixed, they did serve until 1978. 4D train which, no, is not in four dimensions. 4D stands for Double Deck Development and Demonstration. These were a group of prototype trains produced for the Public Transport Corporation in Victoria, Australia, and they were meant to operate in the Melbourne Railway System. As their full name might suggest, these were double-decker trains, having two different levels to maximize passenger capacity, and many examples of this type of layout have been successful all across the world. This isn't one of them. Although it being double-decker really had little to do with its problems, its problems were that it simply never worked. Ever. It spent most of its life sitting, doing absolutely nothing, because literally every single time they went to do anything with it, it proceeded to break somehow. Whether it be the electric system, whether it be the doors not closing, whether it be anything. Literally anything. If it was attached to this thing, it went wrong. In fact, it was out of service so much that I legitimately think that these cars suffered some kind of curse. Because based off of what I've read, it's not like they didn't try to make them work. They did. The PTC really tried, and they just kept breaking. They entered service in 1992, and were finally scrapped in 2006. Believe it or not, they probably never would have been successful even had they worked, because eventually, the PTC decided that they didn't actually want to put in the cost of switching up their stations to deal with a double-decker setup. So it didn't matter anyway. Yeah, this was a complete waste of time is what I'm trying to say. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.